Good afternoon and welcome to NeoConnect 2020. NeoConnect is Neocon's online series of resources, programming, and events designed to connect the community throughout the month of June. I'm Beth Hicks, Managing Director of Marketing for the Design Center at the Merchandise Mart, and I want to thank you for joining us today. Today's session, presented by the Design Center, is a part of the month-long series of CEU webinars hosted at Neocon. This session is approved for one IDCEC credit for interior designers and one AIA LU for architects. You can find details on CEU credits at the bottom of your screen or at neocon.com. Questions will be answered at the end of the session. Please feel free to add any questions you have during the session in the Q&A um, icon, either at the top or the bottom of your screen. And our speaker will do our best to answer as many questions as possible in the time allotted. So today's presentation, we're talking about how to talk to your clients about going green. In this session, Joan Kaufman will discuss how designers need a strategy to talk with clients about how best to go green as the demand increases. Joan will employ evidence-based design, which reveals how materials and products used in interior spaces directly impact the health and wellness of people, pets, and the environment. You'll learn to compellingly inform your clients with accuracy and also how to navigate the latest industry resources to ensure you have the knowledge, tools, and foresight to make sustainable, healthy, and informed decisions for building occupants, as well as provide documentation for project accreditation submissions. Joan Kaufman is a project management and design director for interior planning and design. She is the forefront of design innovation and as a national leader in space planning, lighting, and sustainable design. Utilizing her master's degree in public health, she has dedicated her career to fostering health and wellness throughout the built environment. Her approach of using products that are healthy for both clients and the environment has resulted in award-winning design and lead accredited spaces. She is the past national board member of ASID and was inducted into the ASID College of Fellows in 2015. Joan is a winner of the Halo National Lighting Competition and has been selected as a 2020 National Design Influencer. Please join me in welcoming Joan Kaufman. Hi everyone, I'm Joan Kaufman, and today we're going to talk about how you can talk to your client about going green. When people contemplate going green, they rarely comprehend what it really means. It means making a choice, making conscious choices to incorporate healthy materials, practices, and behaviors into the company culture and into one's lifestyle. This is a brief overview. Each topic that we touch on today could have a CEU all its own. So the goal of this presentation is to help make sense of all the many facets of going green for our clients to help make it meaningful for them. Why? Why is going green important? Is it, why is it worth talking about? Why would your client want to bother? And why would they listen? Because every design decision we make, we believe, impacts the health and wellness of all of us and our planet. There is nothing more important than understanding that we have one planet and one world that's interconnected. I think we all realized that through COVID. It really brought us a higher level of awareness. The interconnectedness impacts each of us for our personal health and wellness. Going green is important for our health and wellness, for the health and wellness of our clients, our staff, as well as the health and wellness of our planet and the environment. We have a finite amount of space and our resources have limits. And our technology also has limits. 
how did I get to this place? Well, many years ago, this is a little story. Um, my daughter was a soccer player. Back then, she was about seven years old. And she loved soccer. She was very good at it. And like many families who are soccer families, we spent a lot of time driving to and from games. And we spent every weekend, every holiday at a soccer tournament. And during that year, I started to notice some changes in my daughter's health. She started to lose weight. She started to um, feel bad. She started to be fatigued. She started to have stomach aches. And we began the process of going to doctors. Many doctors, one after another after another, couldn't figure out what was wrong. We finally did figure it out. And I spent a lot of time with her at Larry Children's here in Chicago. And through that process, as a parent, I began to question, why? why did this happen to us? What did we do wrong? What needs to be changed? How did our daughter get sick? And I started doing research and I found out that where we were living was in a cluster area. There were five EPA cleanup sites within a 25 mile radius of our home. I dug deeper. I started finding out a lot of things. Through those years, I started doing research about the soil, MTBEs, you name it. I, I read everything I could get my hands on. We also changed our family diet quite a bit. I had a son who was allergic to some foods and, and we altered that. So needless to say, we no longer live at that house. We have moved and we live in a much healthier environment, I would like to think. So going green, I learn, is a multifaceted approach. It's actually a mindset. It encompasses every part of your life, start to finish, and is something that you begin to incorporate in one area and it will impact another. So that's why. That's why I'm interested in going green. And that's why I'm passionate about talking about it to clients. But what is it? What is going green? There's so much information out there, it's easy to become confused. Designers as well as clients can go on information overload. So we're going to simplify it a little bit. Let's talk about environmental impact. There are two main buckets, environmental impact and human impact. Environmental mental impact has to do with sustainability, the carbon footprint, our water footprint, resource use and conservation. Individual impact on health, human health and wellness has much more to do with indoor air quality, lighting, accessibility, ergonomics, toxicity, and carcinogens. So those are the two main buckets. And you'll find a common theme running throughout. Environmental factors are very uh, broad. So you'll find laws governed by the EPA, there'll be policies, things of this nature. Human impact is also encompasses behavioral choices, lifestyle choices, fitness, meditation, diet and exercise, sleep. These can also be brought into business practices. The foods we provide in our facilities for our employees, whether or not we provide fitness centers for our employees to use, those can all be part of the picture. Going green is a process of renewal. Once we increase awareness, not only ourselves but our clients, we can act on it. And we can begin to transform our space into an echo and friendly environment. So now we know why we want to go green and why we might want our client to go green and why they would even care. And we know what going green is. We know it's a multifaceted approach. Now how? Exactly how do we talk to them? Well, the first thing to do is to find out what matters. What matters to the client? 
what's their motivation? What possibly would resonate with them? Not every client wants to be certified. Some do because it's a great marketing event. It's a great marketing asset. But not everybody wants that. Some clients just want to have a healthier home or a healthier office for their staff. Or in the case of several of our projects, they just want a healthier place for the pets that they care for and the, the pet owners. So what's our role? The role of the professional consultant. Whether we're an architect, a designer, or an engineer, we're a consultant. And our role is to be the client's advocate and educator. So how do we educate our clients? First step is to educate ourselves. We need to study and evaluate the options and present clear and transparent information to our clients. They're relying on us. They simply don't have time. That's why they hired us. So clients are looking for us to advise them. They want to trust us. That's why we have to provide transparent and accurate information. Other things that can help us to become educated are to obtain our LEED certification, to obtain our WELL certification, or to attend CPUs. The most important thing we can do for our client is to help devise the project strategies and initiatives for going green. In our company, we actually treat going green much as we would a project. There aren't very many clients that I know who would embark on any kind of endeavor without knowing the cost. So the next step that we have to do is find out, first of all, what is the client willing to invest? What are they willing to invest in terms of time and money? Both are valuable and both are necessary. So not only do we have to determine the costs of different materials, products, and services that we would use on a green project, we need to find out what our client is willing to invest because it is time consuming. And lastly, once all the initiatives are reviewed and approved, we can orchestrate the implementation of the green program for the client. So the role of the professional consultant is to design the green initiative, whether it be for a company or for a homeowner, and then to manage that implementation. It's very similar to project phases. So in our company, we start with programming, but we're not programming for space planning or designing an interior. We're programming for the green initiative. What are the goals and criteria for the client? What are they willing to invest? If it's a retrofit of an existing building, we're gonna to need to make an assessment of where they are now versus where they wanna go and to do a gap analysis. And then we can come up with strategies to accomplish those goals. The second step, schematic design. We outline in a, in a brief way the initiatives that we'd like to implement for the client's green initiative. The next step after that is developing them. And that entails all the research. Each product needs to be researched, each material, each service provider, the construction methods, the installation methods, and finally, the maintenance after we're done. And lastly, we move to what we would call documentation. Now, different from construction documents, we would be doing other documentation, whether that be to become lead accredited, LEED certified or well certified, there will be documentation necessary. And in addition to that, we need to demonstrate to the client that the materials we have selected, specified, the processes, the installation methods are documented. When we are developing a green initiative, this is also the policies and procedures that the company might follow or just the goals that a homeowner might have. When you develop a policy that becomes a corporate policy, you're outlining different initiatives in different sections of the client, of the company. Then we develop the policies. Once those are approved, we go to procedures. 
Once the procedures have been created, those are the day-to-day -day functioning that each individual employee would be able to utilize. We may also develop training manuals. The training manuals are an integral part in actually going green. So let's say for an example, you've decided that your company is going to eradicate paper. We're going to move all documents to the cloud and we'll only print things on a very rare case, absolutely necessary. So in order to do that, we would become a company-wide policy. There would be certain times when things would be printed. But in order to do something like that, we'd have to devise a storage process. Where do you keep your files? Who has access to the files? Who maintains them? Who audits them? Um, so that would be a major document control project. But going green in that way and eradicating paper is an amazing endeavor and it achieves a great deal. Lastly, we would have the negotiation or pricing. We go into um, service companies. We might be interviewing multiple companies. Um, once you get um, through this process, maintain your information. We have a really good go-to list of trusted suppliers, installers, uh, manufacturers that have processes and products that we have found are effective on our projects. So we developed a little library. And then lastly, you're going to go through your administration. Now we would be the ones to do the project management for our green initiative, just like we would for any other project. And one of the most important things after the project is implemented is to do an evaluation. There is always something that could be improved. And continuous improvement is what makes things better each time. So going green, it's for all built environments. Where we work, office, hospital, airplane, spaceship, retail center. All spaces impact health and wellness where we heal and replenish, healthcare centers, fitness centers, yoga and workout centers, recreational centers, and where we connect and provide for our family, doggy daycares, animal hospitals, hotels, restaurants, childcare centers, and schools. Literally every space where we live, where we stay, whether it be a hotel for a temporary stay, a senior center for an aging parent, or our own personal home. In the industry, there are two main certifications prevalent right now. LEED, which began in 1998 and was started by the U.S. Green Building Council, and well, which began in 2013, which was started by the International Well Building Institute. Incorporating both of these standards on a project in concert yields the best possible result for your project. The goal is to op optimize building performance for the environment and for human health and wellness. These are third party certifications. They're evidence-based and science-based rating standards that are applicable to the built environment. They help us quantify the effects on the environment as well as human health and wellness. GBCI, the Green Building Certification Institute, certifies both of them. So combining the built environment and health and wellness with dual certification is the highest goal. Let's talk a little bit about LEED. LEED has been around a while and there are six main criteria in LEED and with WELL there's a saying. When we start with LEED, deals with locate, we're just going to do an overview, we're not going to get into every detail here. Location and transportation, 
sustainable sites, water efficiency, energy and atmosphere, materials and resources, indoor environmental quality, innovation, and regional priority if it's applicable. With well, it's a little bit more human focused and human centric. We deal with air, water, nourishment, light, fitness, comfort, mind, and innovation. So for example, when you're looking at daylighting, LEED will dictate a certain amount of daylighting, a percentage. And well, we'll talk a little bit more about the time of day, the exact amount of light, the color rendition of the light. So it gets a little bit more in depth. So again, the combinations of the two standards is the ideal. Complementary cert certifications, if you're going to pursue them both, we require some planning. It's possible if you streamline the process. You don't want to have to repeat steps. So if you decide you want to pursue both, the best thing to do is to start an initial evaluation. Do a complete assessment. So if it's a new construction situation, you'll want to assess all aspects of both. And in our company, what we do is we have it on an Excel spreadsheet and we have the two columns and we see where the crossovers are. And that's the way we start with our initial assessment. One of the most effective things is the questionnaires that WELL provides. They're, they're very helpful and they give a pretty good uh, idea what you're gonna need to do. If it's a retrofit of an existing building, you need to make um, a survey of your major systems. So HVAC, lighting, probably do a survey of the plumbing, take a look at all the major systems uh, in the building, decide where there's maybe room for improvement. Um, and again, doing a gap analysis will be pretty important. Acoustics is a big component that we didn't spend as much time on back in the days of lead. Now we have both. And well places a little bit more focus on acoustics. On the project that we just um, completed, we um, have an acoustic consultant. Um, so in cases where you don't have um, you know, the expertise, or in our firm, it's just better for us to bring in a consultant than it is to uh, devote the time necessary to become expert at that. Uh, we've also, on other projects, used lighting consultants. And as with LEED, there is always a commissioning authority. So we are always working with consultants. So when talking to our clients about going green and compelling them, if you will, for all these great reasons and showing them how they're going to have an amazing building, benefiting their own health, the staff's health, and their wellness, what barriers might we run into? Well, there's a lot of myths out there. They might say to us, they've heard a lot of negative information about going green. You know, it's expensive. Um, you know, the materials are inferior. Uh, you know, the claims that these manufacturers make aren't really true. And, and some of that was true in the beginning when we first had green products. There are five main barriers. The first is lack of awareness. And as we talked about earlier, we are the client's educator they're going to be looking to us. So the more educated we are, the more likely we are to be able to educate them. There's some negative perceptions. How do you overcome those negative perceptions? Well, an endorsement. We have developed in our firm a library of go-to products and reliable solutions over the years. Um, we, once we vet out a product or we vet out a service company, they kind of go on our preferred list. And we know that they're going to deliver for us. Clients are looking for our recommendations. They're looking to have some validation. So we have our library. How do we overcome distrust? 
Well, there's been a lot of um, bad information out there and what we call greenwashing, where let's say a product claims it's, it's this, that, or the other, and you know, it has no CFCs. Well, that means nothing because that hasn't been allowed in years. So there might be some false claims, and clients may remember this. And because of those situations, they're going to be reticent to pursue it. So again, our role is to do adequate research. And when we prepare our clients with good information that's transparent and solid, they'll lose that distrust and they'll become more comfortable. High prices. This is a reality. How do we justify it? Yes, there will be some additional costs to leave. First of all, you're going to have to hire a commissioning authority. And then some of the other costs that we encounter, um, you know, higher efficiency furnace might be more expensive or a higher efficiency HVAC system or adding additional filtration and um, automated water, you know, faucets. It's, it's all more expensive. On the other hand, we explain to our clients that the investment they make now will pay off later, especially in energy savings. There's also a great deal of goodwill that is gained on the marketing side of things for clients. So they have healthier staff and anything they can do to keep um, people happy is a good thing. Keeps costs down. Another thing is a low availability of materials and services. Now we've encountered this a lot. The same thing is we have developed our library and I encourage you to do the same. There are a few groups of collaborative um, designers who share resources, green resources. And um, these groups are available to join. And I found that to be very effective if somebody has tried something and they share that with me. Now, how do we affect things on a bigger level as professionals? Well, the first thing we need to do is to help increase demand for green products and green services. We as professionals can influence. We can influence our manufacturers to provide more products and to provide better products. We can also encourage them to figure out how to charge a more reasonable rate and not charge more. So as businesses, we can request and demand access to these products. It's the supply and demand principle. The more the demand, the more the supply will be made to meet it. And through that process, the cost will go down. We try in our firm to incorporate healthy products on every project. Whether the client is asking for it or not, if there's no difference in cost, we will choose the healthier product over the non-healthier product. And I think all firms have the ability to influence in this way. So here's the approach. How do we get this done? There are some really great resources for, especially on the commercial side. The commercial side of the industry with respect to green is a little bit more mature than the residential side. There are central data banks of products that you can research all in one place. MindClick, Mindful Materials Matter, these are all central databases of to research projects. You can also look up some of the um, toxic contents in your products on the red list, or if you want to, you can look at the Ferro's project. So there are a plethora of resources available to us to help us accomplish our work. Sometimes though, we just can't get what we want on a project. Whether it's due to availability, whether it's due to price, or whether it's due to not being able to meet the project criteria, sometimes we have to accept what they call regrettable substitutions. And this is just part of it. However, we still maintain the goal. Sometimes when we're doing our research, 
we will approach it from a different viewpoint. We'll take a look at what's been removed. Uh, what carcinogen has been removed from this product? Um, and that, that's another way of approaching it that can simplify the process. When we're dealing with green and sustainability, there's what we call zones of sustainability. There's environmental sustainability, societal sustainability, and economic sustainability. It's basically known as profits, planet, and people. So the bottom line is we have to be able to deal with manufacturers in a way that's profitable. Why would they do it? So back to increasing demand and finding ways to influence our manufacturers. So the higher the demand, the more likely they are to develop more products, to make the products more accessible, and so lower the cost. Resources are what we have, production is what we make, and lifestyle is how we use it. All three of these things combine to serve as the zone of sustainability. And that's where we want to be. We want to be right here. What are the initiatives that will help us get our job done? We have initiatives that have a positive impact on the environment as well as personal health and wellness. The first is clean energy. There are a lot of programs out there where clients can get a rebate for using clean energy. Reducing consumption is always important. Some of the buildings we have worked on, they have done solar heating and cooling. And one of the most important steps is to have proper maintenance and upkeep. Just because a building is LEED certified one day doesn't mean it will retain that. The efficiency of the equipment and the efficiency of the systems depends on good and proper maintenance. Developing green standards is really important. And this is part of that strategy I was explaining for a green project, your green initiative that you're developing. Part of that is to develop the acceptable installation methods, the acceptable construction standards, and then to go a step further and devise maintenance of these maintenance programs, perhaps a list of preferred providers, outlining the methods and practices of how they maintain the facility. Um, we talked about going digital and recycling and reducing waste. These are all major initiatives that will help. Design initiatives. Some of the things we've incorporated into buildings include biophilic design. I'll show you later in this presentation a project that we did that also includes aquaponics and biodigestion. We evaluate products for their eco-friendly materials, installation, as well as manufacturing. The go-to list of green products or their library becomes very important. There's another piece of this that I will talk about a little bit later. It's touching on EMS and then setting up your system with your chemicals for your maintenance system. What really matters? Today, you're going to hear a lot of things about the carbon footprint. This is moved to the forefront as one of the most important parts of going green. At Green Build, E3 came out with a calculator. And it, it's very effective. You can find it online and you can calculate the carbon footprint of the building. There are other personal carbon footprint calculators that are available as well. But this is one of the most important components of things right now. Reducing exposure to chemicals is really important. Non-toxic, no VOC, non-carcinogenic products are the second biggest thing we can do when defining a green program. Avoiding harmful ingredients. So we take a look at the composition of fabrics. We take a look at the composition of furniture, like using level. We take a look at where something came from, 
how it was produced, and what's going to happen after where it goes back to. Responsible consumption is another important component of things. We want to recycle as much as we can, and we want to reuse things as much as we can, or repurpose them. And we need to develop systems and standards in our companies and in our private lives for doing these things. Where are we going to have recycling? How is it picked up? Where is it taken to? Does it need to be sorted? So not only do we want to have it, but then we need to go a step further and not only design the space to have the recycling, but go to the service providers and make sure that they are taken to the right place, that it's sorted or not sorted, and how that process is being handled. And lastly, we can facilitate green lifestyle choices. I'd like to share a few case studies, just some examples of some projects we've worked on. I can tell you a little bit about it. This is a animal hospital. It's in Naperville. It, it is a LEED certified building. And it has won several awards. There are a lot of good initiatives with this project. So I'd like to share a little bit about it. This project, even though it's in the suburbs, is um, it has accessible public transportation with the pace buses. The pace bus stop is about a block and a half away. And it's also next to a bike trail that connects to uh, Springbrook, which is the forest preserve. And the bike trail connects to the Illinois Prairie Path, the Prairie Trail, which is a big bike trail that runs through all of Illinois. So it's a wonderful site location. The prime parking areas um, were given for employees who carpool, leafy vehicles, and there's also electric plug-in for electric cars. This roof has 18 skylights, and they have automated photo sensors with some control for the blinds that, that uh, operate when it gets really sunny. So that is uh, innovative. So you can see some of the skylights here and here. And that one, some uh, good points on that. Some of the other things with this building is the low-E glass that was used, automated shading controls on all the windows. It's got a high efficiency HVAC system. Um, MER filters were used during construction, post-construction, and they did a complete clean of the HVAC system. They're very diligent about keeping the filters clean in that building, and there is a um, special high efficiency exhaust system. So when you're dealing with uh, pets and animals, um, the high efficiency exhaust system helps with the odors. Uh, so in the kennel areas, the dog play areas, um, it, it keeps the smells out. There's a composting area in the back of the building. And they're all faucets, toilets, our water sense and automated. The entire lighting system in this building is automated and it's on a central panel. And there's individual light sensor controls in each room. Waste removal is an important thing when you're dealing with animals. Um, so we had to work with EPA for disposal of pet waste. That's another thing that was interesting to learn on this project. Um, they do recycle the rainwater, and there is a windmill out in front of the building that generates power. The building does have solar power and heat. It is, it is also powered by an HVAC system, but there is uh, solar power as well. Inside the lobby, there is an entire wall that is plants, and it's biophilic design elements. And there's a large aquarium next to the reception desk where we used aquaponics. All materials in the facility were chosen to have no VOCs. A few had low VOCs. We paid close attention to recycled content. And we took regional materials for the outdoor play area. And there's a separate cat versus dog area. That's a commercial project. Now I talk a little bit about a residential project. This project is being built from the ground up. It's been working on it for a little over a year. 
And this client sustained a chemical injury. So they're very uh, interested in green and they're very interested in healthy products. So we chose Green Label Carpet for them. They have very little carpet in this house. Almost everything is either uh, porcelain tile, natural stone, or wood. So um, for the areas that is carpet, we chose wool. And not only do we have wool carpet, which has no VOCs and it's completely non-toxic, it's wool pad. And usually if you've ever done a Broadleaf installation on carpet, you know that there's heat seeing tape. It's kind of a waxy, gluey stuff that they put underneath the seam and then they basically iron over it and it melts. And it, it puts out an odor. We did not use that on this project. The client, the client wouldn't have stood for it. So what we did do is we have an outstanding installer who knows how to deal with high-end carpet, wool carpet. The pad seams are sewn, hand sewn, in the field, and so are the carpet seams. It's very effective, it's beautiful, and it's absolutely green. Some of the other things that um, I'll tell you, we ran into some challenges. Um, installation methods matter, and I'm finding uh, this is to be one of the greatest challenges. So just to kind of share, um, our greatest challenges have been with wood stains, varnishes, so adhesives and sealants. So even though the wood floor has been finished and is now encapsulated in um, a waterborne polyurethane, the, the two days of floor finishing, we couldn't let the client in the house. Um, there's, there's a very noxious, toxic smell. So if it's something where we're working on a project where it's a retrofit or it's not new construction, we make the people stay in a hotel. Once that happens, there's another thing that we've encountered is the countertop materials. Countertop materials, often uh, we run into problems. The materials are green, the materials are non-toxic and no VOCs, but where they seem it is with a very toxic odor epoxy. And I haven't been able to find anything. So if you do, please email me. I would like to know, because I've had every installer that we have ever worked with Try to find something non-toxic for your um, quartz and stone seams. Kitchen cabinets is another one. There's no such thing as formaldehyde free. We haven't found it. So again, if you know something, please share. And I've got some cabinets that are custom made for this project. There are um, no added urea formaldehyde plywood core, and they have a they have a wood veneer and they had to be off-gassed. So when the product was finished, we off-gassed it at the warehouse before it was delivered to the site. It's now at the site, the cabinets, and they're off-gassing for an additional two weeks. So that finish will cure and will not give uh, any VOCs to the client. The client is also very sensitive to EMS. And so she has, I'm going to talk a little bit about electromagnetic frequencies and a little bit of the things. We have more and more of these every day. We have Wi-Fi, we have, you know, computers, everything. So this particular client is sensitive to this and she wanted us to limit it. I don't know anybody who can really get rid of Wi-Fi. Even if you got rid of Wi-Fi in your own environment, you would have the Wi-Fi from the two neighbors around you coming into your space. So what we did do is, um, we did this one at Springbrook in Animal Center, and this client has a shield around their transformer. A big ugly transformer in front of the building. We built the masonry surround and it's, it's got a shield inside of it. Now our client actually hired an EMF consultant, largely because she's experienced some of the negative effects on the body which are typically a weaker immune system and a weaker reproductive system, it interferes. So through this, um, she has certain areas in her home that have our hardware. And in our office, we have Wi-Fi free zone. So like at Springbrook, all the dog areas, the kennel areas, the grooming areas, do not have Wi-Fi. Let's see, where are we now? 
we've all just gone through coronavirus. And there's some really interesting studies out there that I've read from the International Energy Agency that is showing a 6% reduction. 6% reduction, sorry about that. So CO2 emissions have gone down. It's due to a lack of travel. With everyone being at home, there's no travel happening. In Paris, there's a study out there right now, the lockdown impact of CO2 emissions in the month of March alone showed a drop of 70%, 72% in Paris. So people are optimistic that this has given us an eye-opening moment and that hopefully change will happen. So it's up to us to work with our local jurisdictions, to talk to our senators and representatives. What will happen? There's a variety of stories out there. There's studies. Everyone's trying to predict what will happen. We can either go back to the status quo or we can make change and we can maintain this drop. So that's what I have to share with you today. And I'd like to show you and share with you this list of beneficial resources that you can use to help yourself become educated and to rely on to sort through the products for your pro projects. Green Label Plus, Green Guard Certification, Green Gold being the best, NAUF, which is um, no added urea formaldehyde, no VOCs. A little trick is to off-gas things prior to installation. Selecting non-toxic adhesives and sealants. Being aware of the methods of installation. Many, many additional educational tools that we can have for ourselves, including becoming a LEED certified professional, becoming a well-accredited professional, there's some seminars going on with the Carbon Leadership Forum. I saw them coming out next week with Metropolis. Learning about the Carbon Footprint Calculator that EC3 came out with. Understanding a life cycle assessment and zero net energy. These are just some things. This is an idea, give you a little glimpse of the many certifications that can be looked at. These are tools that we can use to help us find the products for our projects. These are some of the organizations that we can be involved in, become members of, and attend seminars, we can go to meetings. We can collaborate with other professionals. We do a lot of sharing of information with these professionals, and it's a collaborative effort. So having um, central pools of shared information is one of the greatest benefits of being involved in one of these professional organizations. The USGBC, the International Well Building Institute, Healthy Building Network, Healthcare Without Harm, International Living Futures Institute, the Living Building Challenge, and the Sustainable Furniture Council, which we visited at High Point. So now it's time if you would like to write in and tell us any questions that you may have. Okay, I see a couple good questions here. What is the best first step in going green? I think the best first step is to become educated yourself about why. Why do you want to do it? What is your motivation? 
or if you're talking to your client, finding out what their motivation is. What resonates? What matters? Is it a health concern? In my case, it was. Is it just a benevolent desire to be, provide a better environment for your staff or your customers? What's the motivation? Here's a good one. How do you apply LEED or WELL certifications to residential projects? Are there subcategories for residential applications? There really aren't subcategories for residential applications. Um, LEED and um, WELL have different divisions within them for residential applications, but going green in and of itself is for all environments. So how you would apply those certifications to residential is using the same criteria. So there's a lead for, lead for residential is a little bit different than the six categories of commercial. You could become a lead green associate. That's one beneficial thing for residential. But for all practical purposes, looking at the well certification for residential and applying green principles, it's pretty much the same as a commercial job. There's really no differentiation. You're still going to take into consideration air, water, light, all the same criteria. Here's a good question. How do you sell a client on increasing a budget to allow for the costs associated with green design. I think one of the most important things to do is, first of all, define what exactly the costs are gonna be. When we uh, worked with our clients on the animal hospital, and they had some expectations. And the costs were a little bit higher than expected, and we justified it in a number of ways. First, it is, an intangible huge marketing benefit. It is a premier facility in the western suburbs. People come from all over to take their pets there because they know that the facility is green. And I think that is something that is really worthwhile. The other piece of it is the amount of money that they save over the long term for their highly efficient solar powered facility and their high efficiency HVAC system is, is immeasurable. They do a very good job of maintaining their system. So their lighting levels are kept intact. Um, but again, I think the biggest way to encourage a client to increase their budget is to demonstrate for them how they will get it back in the long term. Here's a good question. Do clients always need a much higher budget to implement design? Or rather, does there need to be a shift in the budget? This is part of what we talked about with designing your green initiative. Part of that process is doing a study on costs so that if you include these costs on the front end, it's much easier they won't need a higher budget because your budget will be established upfront and they will be expecting it. And there really is no point of comparison because from the very beginning, if you design your project to achieve well and lead and simultaneously you're designing your green system, the cost of the project will be incorporated from the very beginning. Okay, here's another thing, another good question. Where are the best places to stay up to date on green initiatives and growth in the industry? Any thoughts on the best place to source news? There are a lot of green publications. So um, I think the best thing to do is to join something, join a organization. You know, it depends on your profession and your area of focus. You know, if you do healthcare, Healthy Building Network, Healthcare Without Harm, 
those would be highly beneficial to you. Um, becoming a USGBC member uh, would always be beneficial. You can go to meetings, you can meet other people. Going to Greenbuild, I went to Greenbuild last year. It's a really good conference. There are many people there, uh, manufacturers displaying their products. There's a ton of seminars you can attend. Um, so Greenbuild is uh, usually in November each year. And I would recommend attending that conference. Um, so those are just a few things you could do. Let's see. Okay, so here's another one. What groups can we join to find people sharing green materials? So um, there's a green collaborative group and it's um, there's a group of ASID designers that do it. There's also um, a group of USGBC, the USGBC um, Far West Suburban Fox Valley area collaborative. I, I reach out to different members in that group on a regular basis. And so we, most of the time, we end up doing it that way. Let's see. How can you convince your clients to develop green projects when everyone will be focused on post-COVID-19 design? I can't think of anything uh, more relevant than to design green post-COVID. Um, people will be focused on infection control. There's no doubt about that. But we have just demonstrated, and I think the message is clear, Everything in the built environment impacts the health and wellness of the occupants. And the well certification as well as the lead certification combined together provide the greatest outcome for clients. So I think post COVID is even more important than ever that we look at these initiatives. And we've all learned a great deal through COVID. It's very interesting that we have all been cooped up in our homes, right? And we're kind of reaching our limit here, ready to go back. But what better time to make our personal environment green than now? Um, what better time? We're all racing to go back. Well, what are we going back to? Let's make sure we're intentional about what we go back to and that we go back to a better world and a better place. And I think showing that um, you know, CO2 emissions have dropped 6% due to COVID and people not traveling a much, as much is a wake up call. And it tells us there's, there's a lot that we can do to, um, to make our world a better place. Okay, here's a good one. How can you maintain your green goals when contractor goals for installation do not align? Um, I will say that designers are influencers. Design professionals, architects, designers, engineers, we are design professionals. We are the influencers. We need to manage the projects. So contractors need to be carefully selected and we need to outline our expectations very clearly up front prior to bid. And so they need to conform to the standards in order to be awarded the contract. If you can do that on the front end, you will avoid a lot of problems later. And of course, going out to the job site and visiting and overseeing and taking a look and observing those installations and correcting them if they don't meet the criteria. But again, establishing the standards as part of the development of your green initiative and having that upfront and clear prior to bid and making it a criteria of being awarded the contract will really make a big difference. Is there any percentage of finishes that have been used to be used 
to be considered a green project. Not really. In our company and our focus, because I'm so passionate about this, we pretty much use green products on every project. Um, it's just interwoven into what we do. We almost don't even think about it anymore. Uh, we pre-screen so many of products that we almost try to avoid having anything in our library that would be toxic. Why bother? So when we are, um, we still have a library. Um, when we're sourcing products in our company, we don't really even um, entertain you know, chemically uh, dangerous project products or products with carcinogens. We just don't. Let's see if there's anything else. I think we've got time for maybe one more question. How did you approach greening your materials library? This is really a good question. Um, again, like I said, we kind of pre-screen our products. So we we look at the material content. We look at, um, you know, I go to Green Build. I enjoyed that. Um, and a lot of the companies, once they uh, see you there, you can really build your library very quickly. We also work with, um, you know, stain resistant companies. And I went to the Sustainable Furnishings Council meeting at High Point. So there's many, many ways that you can begin greening your materials library. And I think it starts by talking to your sales reps. It starts by becoming knowledgeable about which manufacturers are, are taking the initiative with green. Taking a look at the level certification for your furniture. Which furniture suppliers have the best products? And over time, it doesn't take long you simply replace um, the things in your library with those that are green. And developing a go-to list of your top suppliers, there's nothing wrong with that. They're tried and true, they're vetted out, and they've been tested. And so over time, you will develop a really good library. And sharing with your fellow designers. I go to several peer group meetings from my organization and I find that I can share with my fellow designers on a regular basis. And if I ask them for a source, they will definitely share it with me. And I know when I'm asked, I'm very ready to share. So, any more questions? You know, Joan, I think we're out of time today. Uh, but I just want to thank you very much for the wonderfully informative presentation. And uh, appreciate everyone who joined us today. Um, and please visit neocon.com for upcoming programming throughout June. And the recording of this presentation uh, will be on our YouTube page uh, just in a few days. So thank you again, everyone, for joining. And thank you, Joan, for your time today. Thank you.